Okay. So, um, no disclosures. And um, today we'll be talking about the details of formulation and dosing of buprenorphine. Um, and these slides are by Dr. Bott. Hope I do them justice. It's like extra pressure that he's watching me present his slides. Okay, so the objectives today are to describe the differences between the different formulations of buprenorphine, to discuss the difference between protocols of starting buprenorphine at home versus starting in the clinic, which is something that we do still do sometimes, but used to do possibly more in the past. Um, learn about dosing and the duration of maintenance treatment, along with the management of um, potential diversion, and to create a plan for managing the process of medical withdrawal um, when necessary um, from buprenorphine. So let's just uh, talk briefly about the formulations. So this slide is showing um, different formulations of buprenorphine when prescribed for opioid use disorder. And mainly we're using this first um, big block here, the one where it is uh, with naloxone, although we'll discuss um, briefly to the mono product of buprenorphine alone. And it comes, um, again, mainly we'll uh, see the sublingual form. Um, and in that form, it comes in various doses. The most common one found at the pharmacy is the eight milligram buprenorphine, two milligram naloxone found here. Um, and uh, the other forms though do come in handy. I will just say that like when we're talking later on about the microdosing and you're using the two milligram one, I know on Friday we had to call about for pharmacies before we found a pharmacy that had it. So it's important to make sure you know that they'll be able to fill um, the, the, the dose that you're sending. Um, there's also um, a tablet form. Um, mainly now what you'll see is the film, but the tablet form also comes in the two milligram and the eight milligram dose. In this column, you can see the equivalent dose because in the form subsolve, which is another tablet sublingual form, you'll see that the doses are a little bit different. And um, interestingly, the 5.7 milligram dose here is going to be your equivalent to eight milligrams of buprenorphine. So in the few patients that on um, usually a formulary issue that they might need the subsolf, um, you want to make sure that they're having that equivalent dose. Um, the Bunivell film um, is the buccal formulation that goes um, um, not under the tongue, but inside um, the cheek. And it comes in those doses listed there. And then we have also um, in the mono product, just the buprenorphine alone comes in a tablet. I'm sorry about that. And um, also we don't uh, have, we don't use the, the implants, um, but the sublocade um, is our once monthly injection um, comes in these two doses. Um, 300 milligrams is the first dose and 100 milligrams is typically steady state dose. There are more formulations under study right now. So I think in the near future, we'll have more options for people. So, um, again, uh, buprenorphine naloxone should be used for treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, the naloxone, the thing about that is it's not going to be active when taken as prescribed under the tongue. So um, when people are concerned about that, making them withdrawal, that is really there just to decrease the risk of it um, being diverted for use for injection. Because if someone is tolerant to opioids and they were to crush and inject um, the suboxone, the naloxone could cause um, withdrawal. Um, it's also importantly not the reason why suboxone is such a safe medication. It's really the buprenorphine component, which is the partial agonist, and so has that sealing effect um, on respiratory um, drive. And so um, it's really um, the buprenorphine component that is um, what makes it so safe as well. Uh, again, we talked about these uh, formulations for the sublingual form um, in the film um, and the tablet. And we really are just going to use the mono product um, in pregnancy. And if there's a documented allergy to naloxone, which occasionally does occur, I would say that sometimes people will say I'm allergic to suboxone. And if you ask them to just go in a little deeper to what they mean by that, it's oftentimes that they have had precipitated withdrawal occur and that it's not a true allergy. So if, if that's the case, then it's, um, it, it, you know, it may be that um, it's okay to, um, a try again, perhaps with a different strategy for starting on um, the combo product. Um, but if there is a, a, a true allergy to naloxone, that would be a reason to use the mono product. Otherwise, there is increased risk of diversion with it, about a six to one fold increase. And so we tried to avoid it. So 
When uh, someone's asking about film or tablets, largely driven by the, the availability for their pharmacy and insurance coverage, namely, um, sometimes um, people do prefer the film because it tends to dissolve quicker, so usually in about five minutes as opposed to about 10. Um, and it does come in the individual foil wrapping, which um, can help increase safety if someone were, especially a child, were to get to it, um, uh, should still remain um, locked and hidden. But um, So there may be also a decreased risk of, of diversion with um, the film version. So as far as buprenorphine treatment options, um, the sublingual form um, is the current standard of care and allows for self-administration. Um, as we reviewed, there's many doses and formulations and more in the making. Um, it's widely accessible. Um, there is a risk of diversion if you know it's gonna be um, a, a large amount, especially in larger prescriptions um, with, with the patient at home. So there's that risk. And there's moderate cost. However, it's largely being covered by insurances. Um, for the injectable form, um, there's growing clinical experience, I would say, with this, but the, for, for sure that the, the most people are, are on the sublingual form. There's a growing number of um, ways, uh, doses for administering this, um, some under study currently. Um, it has a closed distribution system, um, and so we, we need to be able to work with the pharmacy to have it sent directly to the clinic and the clinic um, be able to inject um, at, at the clinic, not at home. Um, and so essentially has no uh, diversion risk. Uh, there is this um, possibility for enhanced um, ability to take the medication regularly. So in patients who may have trouble taking the medication every day for sublingual or any kind of oral medications, um, the injectable monthly one might be um, a, a better option. So that's something to consider. And certainly it does have higher costs. And so sometimes takes a little bit um, to get this approved um, through the insurance. So a bit more work with prior authorizations. So let's just talk briefly about um, starting Suboxone buprenorphine at home. Is it feasible, safe, effective? Yes, the answer is um, hands down yes. There's a great study with Josh Lee for seven year outcomes on this um, that looked at um, uh, a population of namely patients uh, were on Medicaid in this um, urban underserved population, an N of 485, and they found that um, really it had um, similar rates for folks who started Suboxone at home um, in terms of adverse events, um, no serious adverse events, in terms of risk of precipitated withdrawal or prolonged withdrawal, and importantly, treatment retention um, when compared to clinic start. So this was really the hallmark study that said, you know what, we don't need to start um, Suboxone in clinic, we can do it at home. There are still some times when it is indicated in clinic. Um, so you might consider it for patients who have a low tolerance to, to precipitated withdrawal, and that may be a factor that you know, precludes them from starting the Suboxone. So in order to help them with that process, it could be better to have them start in clinic. Um, certainly patients who transition from methadone, um, we're also seeing this in the time of fentanyl, um, that sometimes those transitions are quite challenging and the risk of precipitated withdrawal is much greater. And so those may be folks who might not transition as well at home. Patients who have cognitive impairment, um, who may not have enough support um, at home to undergo um, uh, you know, the amount of withdrawal necessary to, to kind of time the suboxone initiation with that um, is something to consider. Um, if patients have untreated um, or unstable psychiatric conditions, certainly in the case of suicidality, and they should be seen emergently, um, some of these situations could certainly preclude starting um, sending someone home with a prescription. And then this one is an important one. I think more and more now we're seeing that people do have some experience with buprenorphine, whether prescription or not prescribed to them. Um, uh, and But for the patients who really have not had any um, prior experience with it and have a significant fear of what that withdrawal process may be like, um, then they may be folks who would be better served um, starting in clinic. But the vast majority of people do very, very well starting at home. So what we do is we give people instructions to say, wait until you're feeling really bad. Um, and especially in the time of... Um, you know, transitioning from opiates like heroin, um, shorter acting pain medications, um, we would say to wait at least 12 hours since the last use, um, at least 24 hours since the last use of long acting. Um, and 
this has really changed more now with fentanyl. We kind of are pursue, assuming that fentanyl is present. It's either present in the heroin. It may not come up on your dip um, in clinic. It likely won't. And so unless someone knows that they're using it, um, they, 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 they may um, think that they aren't and that may be present. So we want to consider, um, we want to counsel them to consider waiting a longer period of time regardless. Um, you can consider providing them with the opioid withdrawal scale so that they can, can sort of self-assess and say to, to indicate to them, and there's a picture of this coming up, um, that they should really go for a target score of at least 17. Then when they've gotten to that amount of withdrawal, they can start with a four milligram dose. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, possible microdosing, so going lower, especially in the case of fentanyl, but traditionally starting with a four milligram dose and then waiting about an hour or two and repeating four milligrams um, if the withdrawal continues, which most, most likely they will at that point, um, even if not precipitated and worsen. And then they're going to be given a total dose of 12 to 16 milligrams on day one, usually 16. But if their tolerance is relatively low, their use had been relatively low, then it could be less than that. And reiterating to them that it's okay to call the clinic if, they're, if they happen to precipitate withdrawal. Here's an example of the, um, the sows. Um, and so you can see here, much like the cow scale, this is just, um, they're able to administer this at home. And from zero to four, they're scoring themselves on these subjective and objective findings of withdrawal, right? And so based on this is where you're giving them that goal of um, target, I guess would be a better word, of about 17. So then what do they do? So on day two, they've taken their total of day one that they took throughout the day and they take that total dose in the morning. Encourage them to call the clinic to check in. And then later in the day, if they're continuing to have withdrawal, they can take an additional four milligram dose um, until they feel um, that they're at a comfortable dose where they're not withdrawing or maximum of more, more likely these days, a maximum of 24 milligrams is reached. So especially again with pre presuming that with that, excuse me, fentanyl may be present. Um, uh, I think this may be a slide set that Dr. Bott has updated this on, and I think he may have a higher dose on this as well, um, that, that you could go up to 24 milligrams. I think he's nodding in agreement. So on day three, if needed, um, again, you want to, um, have patient contact and discuss how the induction, how they're 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 doing with their um, initiation of buprenorphine, and then adjust the dose based upon the response. So the the reality is we are often giving patients enough for one week at that um, first visit. It's a very safe medication. Um, um, but we want to be checking in with them. And if you do have concerns about their ability to store it or take it safely, and it's better for them to, to have shorter prescriptions, and that might be adjusted. Um, but really we want them to try to get to their target dose quickly. Um, again, that might be higher, 16, 24 milligrams um, in the first couple of days. And that's really the dose, the dose or doses where we see that those receptors are fully occupied um, and less likely to withdraw, less likely to respond to um, uh, opioid use um, if they were to have a lapse. And then usually at that point, it's good to wait about five to seven days to see if any further increase up to the FDA max of 32 is um, needed or, 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 or not. So just to give some time for steady state. So again, how long do we wait for short acting opioids? 12 hours. Again, it might be that there's fentanyl in the mix. We want to uh, try, if we can, to wait at least 24. For methadone, we want to wait at least 36 hours. And also, um, they should have um, been at lower doses, hopefully targeting lower down to 30 to 45 milligrams of the methadone before being off of it for that time period. Um, and if possible, also to work with their methadone um, clinic on this and discuss the possibility of participating withdrawal and our ability to treat it. Because if you can give them um, the information that they need to be able to, to have a sense of control over the process, then it's much more likely to help them succeed with this. So just to touch upon transitioning from methadone again, we wanna be at 40 milligrams or less um, if possible for a week um, before being off of it. And then no methadone for 48 to 72 hours. Um, importantly, if you can provide medications for symptomatic management to help them with this process because it is quite uncomfortable. Um, to, so some um, ideas for medications could be clonidin to kind of help with that internal sort of ANSYAS feeling, um, ibuprofen if not contraindicated to help with uh, cramping. 
Loperamide can address diarrhea, trazodone and hydroxyzin to help with sleep and anxiety. And then um, we transition back, um, as we talked about already with the buprenorphine, starting at four milligrams um, once in sufficient withdrawal and increasing the dose. And again, this may sometimes go better when someone does a microdose or a slightly slower initiation to decrease the risk of profound withdrawal being precipitated, but um, this is uh, oftentimes um, a um, appropriate approach would be to do the four milligrams. So what do we do when withdrawal is precipitated? Um, most patients are aware of this risk, um, but we wanna make sure we go over it with them ahead of time. And importantly, we don't wanna stop the uh, buprenorphine because if we stop, they're almost sure to, um, to go to, to use opioids to manage their withdrawal, right? So what we wanna do is reassure them that by continuing with the initiation and following the schedule that we've given them for building up on their buprenorphine dose, that they can take comfort medications um, if withdrawal occurs, um, but that it'll just be a slower process for that buprenorphine to kind of wash over and um, take control of those receptors and begin to feel better. So they may be looking more at hours later on um, in the day, possibly even the next day before they're feeling better, but giving them something to anticipate can be helpful. Um, and then uh, if this happens too, and they're at home, um, reminding them that they can certainly come in, come into clinic, um, certainly call um, to, to be able to discuss management. So let's talk briefly about microdose in, in inductions. Mm -hmm. This is when small buprenorphine doses are given in a stepwise approach to decrease risk of precipitated withdrawal um, and associated pain. Um, it can be very useful, especially for folks who have chronic pain um, who, or, who, or who just can't stop using the opioid, um, can't get into enough withdrawal to start. Um, because it doesn't require, because it's such a small dose each time um, that I'll, I'll show you on the next slide, it doesn't require being in withdrawal before starting. Um, and it does take advantage of that high affinity that buprenorphine has at the mu opioid receptor. And so the idea being that even those small doses coming in, that buprenorphine is gonna gather at that receptor and eventually take over, whereas the other medication or, or, or opioids that were there um, will get pushed off eventually and the buprenorphine will essentially win out at the receptor. Then after the buprenorphine is started, the pre-existing opioid um, a week afterwards can be stopped um, after um, the buprenorphine has kind of gotten to the uh, target dose or near target dose. So this is a depiction of the seven days for this microdose, also is known as a Bernice method, um, where on day one, you can see the stepwise approach listed here, the dose, um, and you can see it built up here on day one. You're essentially giving someone a two milligram strip um, and having them cut that strip um, as, as little as an eighth. So you're getting down to 0.25 milligram dose. Um, Occasionally we'll have people do a, a slightly adjusted version of this and do like a half if that seems hard to cut that down to an eighth, um, cut into, sorry, a quarter quarters and start at a 0.5. But to really follow this very gradual micro induction approach, it would be 0.25 milligrams, just settling on the first day and no more. And then on day two, they're taking it twice a day. Then you're gonna increase the dose to 0.5 milligrams. So there's your quarter of a two milligram strip twice a day. And then you start to build up a little more because at this point the buprenorphine is really um, taking over more. So one milligram twice a day, then your two milligram strip twice a day, then four milligrams and then by twice a day. So a total of eight milligrams. And at this point you can transition to the eight milligram strip. Um, and then by day seven, you're getting up to 12 milligrams. And then at that point, the buprenorphine is the pr prevailing um, uh, 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 opioid working at the um, receptor and you, the, the, you would instruct them to not take the other opioid um, and they should not at that point withdraw. So what are some maintenance dosing considerations? Um, 
The FDA maximum for buprenorphine is 32 milligrams. However, most insurances will just cover up to 24 milligrams um, unless um, there's um, prior op um, and in indication for a higher dose. This is um, generally there's been concern about possible diversion at higher than 24 milligrams in the past. What we are um, finding now though is more patients likely are needing the 32 milligrams in the time of fentanyl. Um, uh, there's just such significant tolerance and, um, and to avoid losing people to treatment, we wanna make sure that we're treating them sufficiently. Studies now going on looking at these doses um, and we'll see um, what they show. But I think that I wanna keep in mind that some patients may indeed need um, that higher dose. And how long of a prescription we give is really tied to how they're doing. So um, how are they doing in terms of stability, keeping their um, visits, meeting their goals? Um, so there's no rule about this, but typically what we'll do is do a prescription for a week um, for about four cycles, um, see them back each week, and then could you know increase it sooner or later um, than that, but then increase to two-week prescriptions for a bit and then monthly, and then you can go up to monthly and a two refills is what we would um, uh, at, have as our um, most uh, length of time that we would go without seeing someone would be every 90 days. And then I'm um, talking about uh, diversion management briefly. Um, this, again, we do the urine tox screens at each refill, um, and we want to make sure that we're also testing for buprenorphine, and so we need to make sure that your DIP does have that in clinic. Um, and then also we want to make sure that the send out, at least for people who are on longer prescriptions, um, is sent out at least a, a couple times a year to check that um, the metabolites are actually present as well for buprenorphine. So if that's not an automatic inclusion on your lab, then you want to make sure that that is present um, occasionally. We always are checking our PMP um, report. Um, these are not, uh, this is something we do at our clinic, a 48 hour callback. It's certainly not a requirement, but if your clinic is, or if you had, I would say, particular concern about someone, um, um, or maybe it is your clinic uh, clinic's policy, um, it, it is okay um, to explain to patients as part of the consent process that this may be something they would experience, that they would get a call and would be expected to return into clinic um, within a certain period of time. Um, and they will let us know if they're gonna be out of town so that, that, that we wouldn't be calling them then, um, but they would bring the, their remaining medication for a count and for a urine tox, and then safe storage or lock boxes uh, for everybody. And then um, just to touch upon high potency uh, synthetic opioids, so namely fentanyl, um, I think that uh, initiation of buprenorphine people have been on fentanyl and sometimes in some places works, in, in some cases, excuse me, works okay. Um, and um, however, sometimes people are getting um, certainly more precipitated withdrawal and we're still trying to figure out best approach for, for management. Um, importantly though, the retention and, uh, uh, in treatment um, and um, negative uh, opioid use is appears to be equivalent. Um, the study from Wakeman from 2019 in folks who were on heroin versus fentanyl and initiation. So despite the more difficult start, um, it's really important that patients understand and they're offered treatment, um, that they understand that it is still um, can be uh, very effective and life-saving. And why is there more precipitated withdrawal? Um, perhaps due to some reduced renal clearance with fentanyl, um, perhaps um, that being a lipophilic drug that it's more long acting over time, um, but it's interestingly not seen when a fentanyl patch is replaced with a buprenorphine patch. So this is really um, when it's the uh, fentanyl um, pill form. And we have these two approaches. So one is the microdose and then we'll touch upon macrodose. So we talked about microdose going slow and, and, and waiting longer. And so there was the microdose of the Bernese method where someone can stay on it, not go into withdrawal at all. There's the microdose approach um, described here where someone would get into withdrawal, but we'd recommend that they wait um, even as long as 48 hours and really aim for an initial cow score of at least 13 um, and really using a scale um, so, because um, self-report is, is not, not always um, reliable. Again, really important to go over with the patients um, about um, the use of other medications that can help and what to expect and how to handle any per precipitated withdrawal. 
And then really we just go a little bit slower and sometimes we'll do this with methadone as well. Um, so one to two milligrams every one to three hours. I'm sorry, when we're transitioning from methadone um, and aiming to get to a total of about 16 milligrams by day two. And then they may need to build up to 24 milligrams actually. Um, and then in the case that this doesn't work, um, that the, again, the, even, you know, say we've tried, tried a standard initiations, tried a, a microdose approach, if that's not working, you still want to consider that in order for someone to um, be, receive appropriate treatment for their opioid use disorder, they may need methadone, um, and to look into options there is certainly um, recommended at that point. So this, um, uh, was a, a case um, study of two individuals, four individuals um, who, um, um, who, yes, yeah, so sorry, this was the one where um, the, the, the individuals using the microdose approach, so two milligram doses um, in patients who were in withdrawal already did show significant outcomes. So this, this was a small but important um, demonstration of the effectiveness of the microdose approach. And this study by Lee um, in 2020 showed the um, macrodose approach. And so this table, looking at the first phase of this, um, it showed a two or three days um, initiation um, with uh, buprenorphine, where you can see here were the six individuals. And at day one, um, um, they were given um, the test dose of um, sublingual um, buprenorphine, so, so suboxone. Um, and then on day two, um, th th they were given uh, another dose. However, you can see that two of these individuals received the sublocate injection, 300 milligrams on day two. And on day three, um, uh, three other individuals, I'm sorry, I said six, there were five. Um, three other individuals received the sublocade, and by day four, their cow scale had reduced significantly, so from anywhere from 10 to 16 um, down to zero to four. And then importantly, they um, completed the trial, and um, they had, they had uh, very um, positive outcomes in terms of use and retention and treatment. This was the phase one, but then what was tried on phase two was actually a one day induction, um, which was essentially giving someone one test dose when they were in enough withdrawal um, with their cows of at least eight and um, given one test dose of 24 um, milligrams sublingual. And then immediately when um, withdrawal was not precipitated, given um, the sublocade, um, the injection at 300 milligrams. And you can see here how their cows score improved. And also they had a uh, significant um, uh, they had uh, quite positive outcomes, again, in terms of their use um, and their attention and treatment. So just briefly to talk about withdrawal, um, we don't, you know, recommend um, that buprenorphine be um, just used for acute treatment. We want someone to stay on treatment, but in the case that they may need um, to withdraw off of it, um, we can go over briefly how that occurs. Um, there's really no data, though, to um, say how long we should treat someone. We just know that hot relapse rates are high when people come off of this medication. So studies, um, as you can see here, that are as long as 16 weeks show high um, high relapse rates and that when patients are retained long-term, um, uh, when patients are on medication, they're, they they retain in treatment um, uh, at, at one year here, this study Paco et al shows a 75% retention in treatment. So very important because we know that people who stay in treatment are more likely um, to both not use and to survive. Um, so we want to continue maintenance as long as someone's benefiting from it and meeting their goals. Um, but when they've looked at withdrawal, there's really no difference. So you can see in the study from Ling, there's no difference in the duration of taper, um, no, no, um, uh, and and in in terms of the one month follow up for opioid negative urines, they were quite low when someone did go through a taper. Um, and also importantly, the risk of overdose is, is much greater um, after withdrawal because of the loss of tolerance. Um, and so we need to warn people of those risks. But again, if withdrawal is 
is done, um, then we want to make sure that it's not that someone puts the pressure of like a time frame on themselves to do to get off of buprenorphine, but um, if they are meeting their their goals, um, usually looking at more stable social networks um, and really that it's gradual and that the patient is driving it, that it's going at their pace. And we want them to remain engaged in treatment and therapy. Um, and then to consider naltrexone as an option, um, the injectable form um, after a uh, full completion of withdrawal to perhaps decrease the chance of, of use. So I'll stop there.